All right, geometry. Hey, 2.4. Um, we are now moving into postulates and proofs. So first things first, what is a postulate? Let's look at that. So a postulate is simply a statement that is accepted as true between people without proof. It's like a starting agreement um, that we would accept as true, usually something that we can observe very easily. So let's look at a couple of postulates for points, lines, and planes. Um, and we're going to be using these postulates today to do some basic proofs. So 2.1 says that through any two points, there is exactly one line. Okay, that's postulate 2.1. Make sure you get that into your notes. Through any two points, there's exactly one line. All right, and then there's these nice examples, these picture examples. Um, that you can jot down if you think you need for later. But most of these make pretty good sense. 2.2 says through any three non-collinear, that's important there, non-collinear points, there is exactly one plane. All right. 2.3 says the line contains at least two points. So 2.1 and 2.3, pretty similar. First one says, through any two points, there is one line. Uh, 2.3 says, a line contains at least two points. Kind of saying the same kind of deal. Okay. 2.4, a plane contains at least three non-collinear points. Again, 2.2 and 2.4 kind of go hand in hand. Okay. It has to do with our definition of a plane. And then 2.5 says, if two points lie in a plane, then the entire line containing those points must also lie on that plane. And there's a picture of that here. So if you have any two points that you put on a piece of paper, right? A plane, you can, be th you can think of that as like a piece of paper. Uh, if you have two points on that and you connect those two points, then those two, that entire line that you use to connect those two points is on that plane, right? So these are common sense kind of statements. Um, called postulates. <clears throat> a couple more here. 2.6, if two lines intersect, then their intersection is exactly at one point, which in this case would be P. And if two planes, or like two pieces of paper, were to intersect each other, they would always intersect at a line. In this case, that'd be line W in the picture that's given. All right, so we can use these now. So make sure those are all in your notes um, and you have them down. And then for example one, it says state the postulate that can prove these things. So here it says points A, B, and C determine a plane. Okay, well you're not gonna have these all memorized. Um, <clears throat> so you can just you know refer to your notes when you need these and I'll let you use your notes even on the test here. But uh, for A, B, and C, if there's three points that determine a plane, which one of these would that be? Um, and you can make the argument for 2.2. I think you could make that argument. And for 2.4. Okay, so probably either one you can make the argument. <clears throat> but, um, but yeah, I would, I would go with probably 2.2. Through any three non-collinear points, there's exactly one plane. Okay, so we have three. Notice they didn't say non-collinear there. Um, Should have, but didn't. Uh, Anyway, postulate 2.3. 1B says planes P and Q intersect at a line. Okay, there's only one that that could possibly be. If two planes intersect, intersect at a line, that would be 2.7. All right, so postulate 2.7. Now let's look at examples. So the first example in your book, you'll be doing that, just using your postulates that you wrote down. Okay, there's a guide, and then coming up with the one that makes sense. For example, two, it says determine whether the statement is always true, sometimes true, or never true, and then explain yourself. So here it says two intersecting lines determine a plane. So if you have two lines, if those two lines intersect, does that determine a plane? Uh, well, if you're in two dimensions, it does, but in three dimensions, not necessarily, right? Because you could have one kind of coming out of space, intersecting with one here. Uh, so I would say that that would be sometimes true. Two intersecting lines determine a plane. 
Sometimes this would be true. But not necessarily always. <clears throat> okay? And two dimensions, it would be true uh, all the time. For 2B, it says three lines intersect in two points. So do we ever have three lines intersecting in two points? Let's see if we can make that happen. Uh, well, if we put one right here, the three lines would intersect at one point. Uh, if we did, let's do it a little different. Like if we do this, okay, here we have three lines intersecting in two points. This technically works, but I think they want the three lines all to intersect, and these are technically looking parallel. So if they're not parallel, they'll eventually cross. So I think we should show that slightly different. What if we did it like this? Okay. If we have something like that, then we'd have three points. Um, so if the three are going to intersect, notice that means avoiding parallel, because parallel could make this true, then this would be never true, as long as all three lines intersect. There's no way to do it in two points. Okay, so example two, you'll be doing some of that sometimes, always, never. And then here we go for the proof process. Um, <clears throat> let me erase some of these annotations real quick. Sorry, guys. So proof process. Make sure you get this into the notes. Uh, so you're probably going to have to pause the video here because uh, I make you write these down. So with a proof, you guys, I'm going to only make you do one type of proof this year. We're going to focus on one type of proof. The type of proof that we're going to look at is the two-column proof. Okay. Um, there's other types of proofs like flow proofs, um, written proofs. You know, There's different types of proofs. Just to make it less confusing, we're going to just focus on a two-column proof. On a two-column proof, what happens is we put the, the information that we're trying to prove or like the, the thing that we're trying to say, we put that on the left side. And then the reasoning, the reasoning for the statement is on the right side for a two-column proof. Okay, So the reasoning always goes over here. Um, and our statements always go on the left. So now that we know that, let's look at the steps for doing the proof. Okay, so the first thing is we're going to state the given. So they're going to give us some information to start with. We're going to put that information here. And then the reason that we always give for the step one is the, the reasoning is that it is given. It's given to us. Okay. Uh, for step two, it says state the theorem or conjecture to be proven. Okay, so that's the thing we're trying to prove. So it'll say something like prove that line AB is parallel to line BC. I don't know, give, give something kind of crazy. Um, but whatever we're trying to prove, we're going to put down here on a two-column proof. So this is the, the thing to be proven. Thing to be Proven. Okay. I'm sorry, I don't know what's going on with my pen there. And then step three says create a deductive argument by forming a logical chain of statements linking the given to what you're trying to prove. Okay, so think of it like a chain. This is also think of it like a paper where like it just one thing flows to the next. So the each thing has to be determined by the previous thing that you've proven. So it has to be a logical chain of events that somebody can read through. Step four, you're going to justify each statement with a reason. Those reasons on a two-column proof go on the right side. These are always going to be definitions. Make sure you get this in your notes. Algebraic properties, postulates like we just learned, and theorems. Okay, so you're going to learn a bunch of these things in the weeks to come and you're going to use them in proofs. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then step five says, state what it is that you have proven. Okay, so this is the proven, the very last thing. State what it is that you've proven, and then you're done. So we'll, don't worry, this is going to sound a little confusing because you haven't done one of these yet, but once you do one, you'll see kind of how it works. 
Now, we just mentioned theorems. I should talk about theorems and what those are. So theorems are what we call a statement or conjecture that has been proven. So a postulate, we can both agree that it's something is, is true without proof, like we can agree on a characteristic of something. A theorem is something that we have, we've already proven. So if we've proven something out, we call it a theorem, and we can use those theorems, since they're already like building blocks of things we've proven, into more complicated proofs. Okay, so the theorems have already been proven. Example five. So it says, given that C is between A and B, let's draw a picture. Okay, so here's line A. Don't know what's going on with my iPad here. Uh, given line A, B, uh, it says C is somewhere between, and then it says that A, C, and C, B are congruent. That sign means congruent. Okay, so we'll put C right there in the middle. Write a two-column proof to show that C is the midpoint of line A, B. All right, so here, this is how one of these two-column proofs go. The first thing we're going to do, we're going to state the given. So the given is that um, C is between A and B, and we're also given that AC is congruent to CB, and then our reason is that this is given. Okay, our proof statement, <clears throat> so following, our, following our, uh, our chain up here, the theorem that we're going to prove is that, the thing to be proven is that C is the midpoint of AB. So that's what we're trying to prove. And now we're going to have to fill in steps in between that proves it. OK? So <clears throat> the first thing that we have to do, since, since it was given that C is between A and B, um, and that AC is congruent to CB, we can say something about this. We can say, since that's congruent, we can say that AC is equal to CB. And we can use our definition of congruence. If two things are congruent, we know that they're equal. So we can now say that they're equal. Okay, and we really don't need this next step because we can basically go from there to here and say C has to be the midpoint of AB by the definition of a midpoint. Okay, if AC is equal to CB, then we know that that's the definition of a midpoint. Here, let me write this a little different here. By definition of a midpoint, we know that C is the midpoint of AB. All right, so this still might be a little fuzzy and like, oh, what are we doing? Uh, don't worry, we'll do a lot more of these. I'm going to do some algebraic ones, which is what we're really going to focus on this time. Um, so let's look at that. Before we do that, we need to know some properties of numbers. So this is, should all be reviewed from Algebra 1, but we have a bunch of different properties here. I'm going to only focus on these first four. But notice the other one that we'll use a lot of here would be the distributive property and also substitution we use a lot as well. Um, so the addition property of equality says if A is equal to B, then if we split that into parts, A plus C, like if I add C to one side of the equation, I must add C to the other, and that is perfectly fine. I can add the same thing to both sides of an equation. The subtraction property says I can subtract the same thing from both sides of an equation. The multiplication property says I can multiply both sides of the equation by the same number, and they'll still be equal. And then the division property says I can divide both sides of an equation by the same number, and they will be equal. So we're going to use these properties along with a couple of these others here. <clears throat> so um, I think we all know the distributive property. We did that a ton in Algebra 1. For substitution, you guys, if I say something like 2 plus 3 and then on my next line down, I change that to 5, whenever you perform an operation like this, that is known as a substitution. Okay, so we use substitution a lot in math whenever you solve a part of an equation that is a substitution. So let's look at 
this algebraic proof for this guy. So the very first thing is our statement is going to be the given. So our given is 5x plus 1 over 2 minus 8 is equal to 0. That's given to us. And now what they want us to do is algebraically just show step by step how we would solve this. So the next step down might say uh, 5x plus 1 divided by 2 equals 8. Okay, how did I get there? I added 8 to both sides. So whenever you add something to both sides, that is known as an addition property. So this is the addition property of equality. You can abbreviate, that's just fine. The next thing I would do to solve this is I'd multiply both sides by 2. So if I do that, I would get 5x plus 1 is equal to 16. And that's the multiplication property of equality. Uh, and then I would subtract, right? So I would subtract 1 from both sides. So I would say 5x is equal to 15. Okay, and how did I get from here to here? That was known as the subtraction property of equality. And then lastly here, we could say that um, uh, x is equal to 3. And actually, you can probably just go straight to here. Uh, and we, to get from here to there, that would be called the division property of equality if we divide both sides by 5. Okay, so there's an algebraic proof. It's just kind of basically telling a reason for each of your steps. And that's it. So you guys, today, for your homework, I have a homework sheet. I'm not sure. Don't worry about the numbers that are on this thing here. Um, but I really want you to just focus on um, some of the basics of the building blocks of proofs, some of these characteristics that we've talked about today, these postulates. Um, so use them. Get used to them. Get comfortable with them. Anytime it says that you are to write some kind of proof from now on, even if it's a flow proof or a paragraph proof, we're going to change those directions to two column. Okay, so you will always be writing two column proofs. Two column proofs look like the one that we just did, where you give a statement and then you give a reason for your statement. All right, we'll do some more of these in class. We'll catch you guys next time.